Welcome to Copcast. I'm Rumbi Chakamba, Associate Editor at DevEx, and I'm headed to Sham el Sheikh in Egypt for this year's United Nations Climate Conference. In this podcast series, we bring you inside the walls of the Blue Zone for a series of in depth conversations with climate and development leaders, asking them the big questions what's really needed to make meaningful progress towards climate goals, and what role should the development community play to support that? There is no way we can meet some of our broader goals of poverty reduction, of agricultural productivity increase, of women's economic empowerment, unless you actually factor climate adaptation into each and every one of those. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, around 80% of the farmland in Sub Saharan Africa and Asia is managed by smallholder farmers, who provide up to 80% of the food supply in these regions. But these farmers also bear the brunt of climate change and the degradation of natural resources. Extreme weather events such as droughts, storms and floods are putting pressure on their livelihoods. In this episode of Copcast, my colleague Sarah Jerving sits down with Mark Suzman, CEO of the Gates Foundation, to discuss their recently announced $1.4 billion investment in smallholder farmers. This conversation was recorded at the International Development Finance Club Pavilion, which is one of the many pavilions representing different countries, causes, and organizations at COP27. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Great to be here. So the foundation made a significant announcement yesterday. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, so it is uh, by far the biggest announcement we've made in the climate space. It was $1.4 billion over the next four years to support climate adaptation. And the focus of that is very much on small-scale producer farmers, smallholder farmers. And that is because what is not often understood is that of the world's very poorest, those who still live on $2 a day or less, 70% are rural and the overwhelming majority are smallholder farmers themselves. And they are the ones who have also been most affected by climate change already, even though by any measure they contributed the least to any greenhouse gas emissions. So these resources are intended to do a wide range of investments to support them, to support their lives and livelihoods, to allow them both to gain income, but also uh, has health impacts in terms of providing greater nutrition and investment in their families. And there's a lot of focus on innovation, research, development. Can you talk a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so one of the key areas is the fact that uh, there's a lot of natural research that goes on uh, for things that affect people in rich countries, uh, of how can you get uh, more uh, weather-resistant wheat or rice that grows in the American Midwest. What doesn't happen as much is research into crops that directly support these smallholder farmers, mostly in the tropics in South, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. That includes both taking some of those staples that do get significant international investment, like maize or rice, but equipping them so that they work in the agroecological conditions of, say, a West or Central Africa, which actually requires different breeding. And you're trying to make them drought resistant, flood resilient, grow more quickly uh, so that you can have multiple planting uh, seasons. And in addition to those crops, there are a number of what we call orphan crops, which are crops that Africans overwhelmingly depend on, like sorghum, cassava, yams, millet, where there is very, very little, if any, research that goes on into those same traits. And a lot of our resources will be working with institutes like, for example, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, which is based in Ibadan, Nigeria, to try and develop those tools going forward. And we're doing similar work, those are in seeds, but we're doing similar work in livestock, because you can actually make livestock, chicken, cattle, more resilient, more able to survive and be productive in terms of meat or milk production in drought or flood conditions. And why did you choose these partners? 
Well, on the research side, the partner, the IITA that I mentioned, is a sub-part of a global network called the Consultative Group for International Agriculture. It's a mouthful, but it's a global network of research institutes which has been in existence for several decades and has actually made uh, most of the publicly funded progress in agricultural productivity that the world has seen over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And that is a group of institutes which do amazing work, but we think are significantly underfunded. Total global funding is less than a billion dollars a year. We think it should be doubled to at least two billion dollars a year. They have proven track records. The uh, products that come out of uh, their work are for the public good, so they're not you know, commercial proprietary products uh, that are restricted. And so we think that's a uh, very logical set of investments. We've partnered with them for many years and we think they're going to be critical. Uh, but that is just on the seeds. That's, that's on the seed systems. We actually need to think all the way through into how do you actually help the farmers on the ground? Because those changes are happening right now. We've seen these unprecedented floods in Pakistan, for example, with a third of the country underwater and 30% of the population displaced and fields flooded and still unable to plant three months after the floods. That is clearly climate change induced. Similarly, a devastating uh, drought in the Horn of Africa. While the Horn of Africa has had many droughts over the years, this is their fourth drought season heading into a fifth. That is completely unprecedented. And uh, those farmers are now not able to feed themselves and their families and in fact we have severe acute malnutrition crises happening across countries like Somalia and so we also have a set of investments working in how can we provide direct support to those farmers right now to make sure they have the tools and products for the upcoming planting season to try and make sure that the next uh, season doesn't have the same food uh, insecurities we're providing some direct humanitarian support as well in the short term to provide nutrition and other related tools, working with partners like UNICEF and USAID. But that's, if you like, when we've already failed. You're only treating the uh, acute malnutrition if you haven't provided the tools and the resilience to allow those families to feed themselves, to generate the income, to uh, invest in their own families. And so we're trying to do it at both ends of the spectrum, the medium to long-term research and the direct support to help them put in place more resilient crop systems today. Okay, interesting. That was one of the questions that I did have is the, the 1.4 billion announced yesterday does feel like a, more of a long-term investment. It's uh, over the course of four years, but focused on the research and development angle. So it, it's an entire continuum. The, the seeds are critically important because we know, you know climate change isn't suddenly going to pause for us in 2025. This is an escalator where we need the ongoing research to continue increasing productivity resilience against floods and droughts and so those are uh, ongoing long-term investments and I'm sure we will re-up some of them after this four-year commitment once we know what's been more successful or less successful but we're very conscious of the need to act now in fact that's one of our core messages here at COP because there's so much talk that is a little bit abstract about long-term abstract amounts of money abstract policies and we're saying actually these crises I've been talking about, from the Horn of Africa to Nigeria, I just met with the Nigerian finance minister, and we were talking about the devastating floods that have affected around 10 states in Nigeria over the last month there, and how to help them with the current planting season. And then there's the medium term. So, uh, for example, we are working with existing tools with uh, farmers in Mozambique, women farmers in Mozambique, around cassava. Cassava is already a more drought-resistant crop than maize but it's not as widely used for cooking and uh, related activities. We've been working to help provide training and um, workshops and a connection to markets about how you can take cassava meal and turn it into breads and other products which are actually going to be more durable and resilient in drought conditions and provide more income for those farmers. Similarly, we've been working uh, in Kenya uh, with a group that's looking at uh, innovative micro-insurance products that are trying to pilot micro-insurance for smallholder farmers to track through with weather patterns and related issues, which is a difficult market to attract private capital because you don't know what the returns are, but we can hopefully prove 
that the market is there and crowding the private capital. And one additional example, which is also live, we've just uh, launched it, but we'll be moving into implementation mode, is a thing called the Digital Adaptation Atlas, which is a public good atlas for Africa, where we're using tools that, again, wealthy farmers in Europe or North America already are able to use, which is to take satellite mapping and do deep diagnoses at a very close level of the different soils in different agroecological zones to allow you to customize much better which crops will be more productive, how can you maximize your water use, how can you maximize your fertilizer use, meaning you actually use less fertilizer but in different formulations that are going to be more useful for those soils. That's now again created as a public good for the continent and we are working with countries to roll it out so that different ministries and uh, agricultural uh, agents can actually be providing the advice and uh, guidance to farmers to start using that more productively. So we're trying very much to do a both and across the spectrum. Okay, great. Um, and I have heard criticisms of the, the Gates Foundation as having a focus on uh, industrial agriculture, but this announcement is very focused on smallholder farmers. Um, how would you kind of respond to that criticism and would you say that this is a pivot? Uh, is the uh, foundation kind of moving towards uh, smallholder farmers in a way that it hadn't before? No, that's a complete misrepresentation of our work. We have always been focused on smallholder farmers because our mandate is the foundation. It's a simple vision and mandate built around the vision that every person deserves the chance to a healthy and productive life. So that's what led us first into significant investments in global health because you could see these massive global health inequities facing the poorest in terms of not having access to basic vaccines or antiretrovirals or anti and postnatal care and that's why we uh, are significant supporters there. When we were looking for other areas of huge global inequity, it was clear that food production uh, and agricultural production was one of those areas that commercial agriculture actually often takes away from or doesn't allow the focus on the smallholder farmers who depend on it for their livelihoods. And so our focus has always been how can we actually support those who depend on it for both income and often their own nutrition and their family's nutrition because they often eat their own produce as well as selling into the markets for income. Uh, and what has changed is a much more deliberate focus on linking this to climate and climate adaptation because these simple fact is what's ch the changing weather patterns mean that the traditional approaches we've used simply are no longer fit for purpose. We need to have an accelerated cycle of some of these new crop products. We need to accelerate the rollout of tools like these digital food atlases, like the connection to markets. And so if anything, it's underlined the urgency and the focus, but it's definitely not a pivot of our strategy. And is all of this 1.4 billion um new money or has any of it been previously announced? Uh, no, so we've had long-term investments and support to the CGAR system and others where we've worked with them in the past so we've had this is how we know and are conf conf confident they're going to be uh, strong partners but today's announcement of 1.4 billion represents a commitment of fully unallocated money which will be allocated over the next four years in addition to allocating it over the next four years we will be documenting very carefully how and where it is spent because we think that's one of the other challenges in the uh, climate uh, the general climate space for both mitigation and adaptation is you get lots of big dollar figures thrown out and not as much tracking of where did that money actually go what did you learn and so we're hoping both by the size of the investment, which is a significant one, very significant one, uh, even for the Gates Foundation, and the way in which we're going to be implementing it, that we're hoping is both a model uh, for others and a challenge to other partners to come in and do the same. And uh, one additional point, which would be important to stress, is we're also doing it very directly in partnership with and following consultations with particularly African governments uh, they, because uh, the African Union has launched and supported an agri Africa Agricultural Adaptation Initiative. It's one of the uh, initiatives that they are uh, promoting here at COP, asking other donors to come in and say, you can see the needs right now. We've been working with that group uh, directly uh, to try and uh, both provide some technical advice where we can, including to some of their climate negotiators, but also make sure we're being responsive and fully aligned with their own stated priorities so that this is not a 
you know, top-down uh, you know, announcement which we're making. It's very much been built in dialogue with our local partners at the national and regional level. And the Gates Foundation has been involved in a 1CGIAR reform, and there has been some criticism that it has taken away autonomy from uh, some of the centers in an effort to centralize. Um, I'd like to hear kind of your response to that and whether there is any concern that that could harm innovation um, if some research centers kind of disassociate with CGIR over kind of this administrative change. Uh, yes, we believe that the CGIR reform is very much uh, you know, one of those classic both and results. We absolutely support and understand, and like I mentioned, the IITA in Ibadan, but there are many other centers the deep expertise that each center has around their areas. There's, there's the Livestock Center in uh, East Africa, Ilri, that we work with. There's the Rice Center in the Philippines we work with. Those all do amazing work, and we want to make sure that they continue to have the resources to do and uh, uh, to do and expand on that. But we also believe that there was actually uh, some real synergies and opportunities for uh, collaboration and shared best practices lost without having the one CGIR system. So by actually having intentionally a much more joined up global strategy across the full CGIR, that uh, especially in the context of some of these challenges like climate adaptation where you're trying to look across the different crops and resources and livestock uh, and other interventions, that this, is, this will absolutely, in the medium to longer term, maximize the impact of the CGIR and hopefully be the platform that allows us to get that doubling of funding from under a billion dollars today to two billion dollars over the next few years, which we're looking for. On the 1.4 billion um, announcement, as mentioned, it's it spread over four years um, and you also do have this kind of current strategy with the, the food crisis happening um, globally now, uh, but when do we anticipate to see the benefits of this 1.4? Uh, yeah, well, I did make a separate announcement uh, at the UN General Assembly, which was a hundred million dollar announcement into the immediate response to the food crisis, because we know that you know, we're not a, a humanitarian agency, but it included a 20 million dollar commitment uh, to a, a partnership that UNICEF and USAID have been doing to address severe acute malnutrition, and we've been providing some bridging finance and other tools to UNICEF as well in terms of addressing the current crisis. And that also included a number of uh, sets of additional investments in uh, areas like uh, direct support to women farmers in uh, some areas. So we were trying to do that as a standalone $100 million announcement to meet the crisis right now. For this 1.4 billion, it's going to be uh, different in each of the categories. You know, so some of the support that happens right now for the Africa Adaptation Initiative and the negotiators and the technical advice, that's advice that's coming in right now on the best policies and implementation that, again, as I meet with African ministers and others here at COP, we're trying to provide them with advice tools on what they should be optimizing their spending on. And so hopefully you see some of that cycle coming through right now. But obviously this is laying the groundwork as well for a lot of a longer term investment. Something like the Adaptation Atlas again, there'll be a couple of countries where we're going deep and working with to show and pilot how this can be used. So hopefully that will have an immediate impact uh, for those countries. But again, the hope is this will be a public good that is really used much, much more widely across the continent, even without our direct intervention uh, going forward. WHO says the end of the COVID-19 pandemic is in sight. But with waves of infection still expected in the near future, how are health systems going to cope? What's going to happen to initiatives that were formed during the pandemic, like COVAX? And how is the world preparing for the next global health emergency? I'm Janelle Ravelo, Senior Global Health Reporter for DevEx. And every Thursday, we bring you answers to these questions and other exclusive news and insights on everything global health in our free weekly newsletter, DevEx Checkup. Visit devx.com slash newsletters to subscribe. The Gates Foundation has a huge health portfolio um, and climate change has a significant impact on how diseases are evolving um, 
uh, number of cases and, and whatnot, um, malaria in particular, uh, is uh, expected to be heavily impacted by um, climate change. How is the, the Gates Foundation's uh, health portfolio adapting to climate change? Yes, yeah, so there are uh, several ways in which um, climate change is affecting health directly. Actually, by far the most serious right now is the one we partially addressed, which is the effect on nutrition. Because uh, you know, it, when children are malnourished in the first two years of life and you get stunting and wasting, their bodies and brains will never fully recover to what would have been their full potential. So that's an enormous human tragedy that happens real time and the current droughts and floods are exacerbating that and so we see a huge knock on health impact and that's part of the reason we've made those nutrition investments as well and that's climate change related. There's also the uh, link to disease and disease prevalence. You mentioned malaria, uh, you mentioned, uh, what well, you didn't mention, but another uh, mosquito-borne disease, dengue, actually uh, looks like it may grow because these are diseases that, where the mosquitoes are moving into what become warmer conditions. And so absolutely that's something that needs to be factored in to the work of groups like the Global Fund to fight uh, HDB and malaria or the President's Malaria Initiative and we're working with them on that although the time frame again is a little slower in terms of uh, how it's coming but we need to put in place those that infrastructure now. There are also um, health effects that you might not intuitively think of at the first event. I mentioned those Pakistani floods. Uh, as you may know, we were down to a handful of polio cases, wild polio virus cases on the planet only in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And there had just been a small, very localized outbreak of around 20 cases in the northeast of Pakistan uh, early this year, where, again, that's always a tragedy, but the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, of which we're major funders, has a plan. What you do is an emergency uh, campaign to go in and inoculate everyone around there and you can normally contain the virus and help knock it out and stop it spreading further. With the floods, all the polio campaign had to stop. Not only did the campaign stop, but you had massive internal displacement of people. So people moved carrying the polio virus and now we've had a worrying recent signs where polio has re-emerged in wastewater surveillance in some of the major cities in Pakistan. Now again, we're doing everything we can to go in and cope it, but that's an example about how a climate disaster can actually indirectly generate uh, conditions for an infectious disease. And so there are multiple dimensions of that that we're working on. What role does a uh, foundation like the Gates Foundation play in COP over the next few weeks? Well, we're obviously not an official party to the negotiations. You know, those are something that happen between member states and they're critically important. We think that our role can be both, um, to some degree, a, if you like, a, a trend set or a statement set. The announcement we made yesterday was deliberately intended to show the kind of investments that can and should be made and that we believe are demonstrably high return investments in an area like adaptation. That that could be something that we hope provides both a model for other donors, a potential for platform for partnerships with multilateral development banks and other multilateral partners, and also a framework, as, as I mentioned in my recent discussion just an hour ago with the Nigerian finance minister, that we were then able to talk through specifically areas we might be able to work with them on uh, around climate adaptation in the, in the immediate future. So that's one role. I think a second one is because we are um, an organization that develops and works with a lot of technically expert partners, uh, of which there are huge numbers here, but we're able to support and to some degree you know, convene and facilitate discussion and dialogue between groups that uh, otherwise might not be connecting in quite the same way, including civil society. And so I met yesterday uh, morning with a group that included uh, the Pan-African uh, climate justice uh, movements, uh, that included some of the African negotiators, uh, that you know, really again trying, I was deliberately trying to make it my first meeting to make sure that I was listening to a group of African stakeholders on the ground 
uh, to help inform me as I'm able to sit in, because I do get to go and sit in some of these rooms, as I did uh, yesterday, uh, making the announcement with the mixture of heads of state and the heads of agencies, and hopefully, you know, as a philanthropy, it's a set of messages and positions that we can carry and use our platform, uh, again, to help drive through uh, greater attention and energy. Uh, but the honest answer, we're, we're not that interested in the conference for the conference's sake. We're interested in outcomes delivered from the conference and outcomes that are measurable in both financial commitments but then the concrete partnerships that we can actually uh, track, hopefully be part of, that will support the millions of men and women and children who are, as we speak right now, facing the consequences of climate change in real time. And what can we expect from the foundation moving forward on climate? Well, we're going to be learning. As I say, this is a, marks a significant shift for us, meaning it's, it's based on a lot of learning that we've had in the agricultural development space to be, be so explicitly focused on climate adaptation and to commit this volume of resources is a new thing for us. It's partly a reflection of understanding that there is no way we can meet some of our broader goals of poverty reduction, of agricultural productivity increase, of women's economic empowerment, unless you actually factor climate adaptation into each and every one of those because it's such a so intertwined now uh, to those outcomes and so uh, we believe um, that the investments that we've announced today are based on you know strong evidence that, so we're relatively confident they will work but like any sets of investments some will fail some will work better than others. One of the other things that we try to do as a foundation constantly across all of our health and development work is share with the field what works and what doesn't to try and we are able to take sometimes some greater risks than governments or other partners are because we have the philanthropic capital and we should be doing that. And so going forward, uh, I don't think there's any scenario for the likely lifetime of the foundation uh, and we're a foundation that's going to do ourselves out of business um, eventually, that we will not have climate adaptation as one of our priorities because sadly the science shows us that the need for climate adaptation is now an absolute reality for uh, at least the next three to four decades. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Great, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Copcast. We'll be publishing episodes every day throughout COP27. So make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others you think would be interested in it. You can also leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have some feedback about this episode that you want to share or are at COP and want to let us know what we should be covering, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on social media at devx and at rumbichakamba underscore or you can drop us an email at podcast.devx.com. At